Let's all stand this morning and turn to the book of First Chronicles, please. Chapter number 21 and verse 1. First Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter number 21 and verse number 1. First Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 1. And Satan stood up against Israel. Now here's how he did it. He provoked David to number Israel. You see, David was the indirect vehicle Satan used to come against Israel. He hates the church of God, the word of God, and the Jew. And if you find anyone who is against the Jew, or against the church, or against the Word, I don't care how slick, smooth, pretty, religious, great, rich, whatever he might or she might be, they are satanically inspired. Father, in Jesus' name, give me unction now to preach Your Word. And Heavenly Father, open the hearts of the people, Lord, to receive it. In Jesus' name we pray, and Amen. You can be seated. This is the first mention of the name of Satan in the Bible. We have what we call in studying the Scriptures the law of first mention. Because it's very important when you find a word or a subject or a theme first mentioned in the Bible to study the location of that very carefully. For it will reveal a great deal about what you'll find later on in the Scriptures. So the law of first mention is a very good thing. It's a viable thing. It's the kind of thing that you can take hold of and say there's truth in this and this is not just something that's been added to embellish anything. In First Chronicles chapter number 21 and verse 1, the first time that the name Satan shows up in the Bible is right before you. Now this is not the first time Satan shows up in the Bible. We know that he was in that serpent when they beguiled Eve. We know that. We know that because the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Timothy plainly that it was the devil. But here in 1 Chronicles chapter number 21 and verse number 1, we find the word Satan. Now the word Satan is a Hebrew word. As a matter of fact, if you had a Hebrew Bible in front of you and you just opened it up and began to read it, you would read the word Satan. Now you could translate that word a number of different ways. It could be translated, and which is the most accurate translation of it, you could say the adversary, because that's exactly what the word means. You see, that's a Hebrew word that is not only a name, but it's a word. Because sometimes the word can show up in a different context and be translated adversary. But Satan is also the name of the devil. Devil is a generic term which simply means a adversary in English. The, he, the, the, I think the Spanish would say Diablos. Rio Diablos they have out west. It's called the river of the devil. The devil is one who torments and persecutes. The devil is the one who gets, who gets in your life and literally tears apart everything that's good about you. The devil therefore in scripture has a name. And his name is Satan. And therefore by his name itself we understand the very nature of who Satan is. He's an adversary. He, my friend, therefore comes against you in a very cunning manner. And he knows exactly what he's doing. He's had over 6,000 years of experience in dealing with men. Satan's not a man. He's an anointed cherub that covereth in Ezekiel chapter number 28. And he fell from that great position of authority. The cherubim has the face of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of a man, and the face of an eagle. Therefore it has by its very nature in creation something to do with the earth. And Satan therefore is connected to this earth in a very special way. The Lord Jesus said, I saw Satan as lightning fall to the earth. So the devil is in this earth and he has a kingdom in this world. For the kingdoms of this world have been handed to him when Adam fell in the book of Genesis. 
Satan therefore has rightful authority to place on the throne whomsoever he will during this time. When he said to the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter number 4, All the kingdoms of this world are mine, and I can give them to whomsoever I will. That was not an idle boast. He could have. But the Lord Jesus Christ refused the kingdoms of this world. Until Revelation chapter number 11, when the Bible says the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. Jesus Christ got the kingdoms of this world by dying for them on the cross and shedding His precious blood. Satan got the kingdoms of this world by treachery and deceit because that's his nature. He is a deceiver and a liar. He is double-minded. He is never what he appears to be. So in the book of 1 Chronicles, when Satan tempted David to number Israel... David did not see some specter cross before his eyes. He did not have some ghost come and wistfully move him to number his people. But what happened to David was simple. A spirit came upon him. It might have been a spirit of pride because that's why they did the numbering. And that's why God said, I do not want you to number these people. Your strength does not lie in numbers. Your strength lies in your dependence upon me. You are not like the other nations. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when you go into battle, I will go before you, he said. And I will drive the enemy from before your face. So you do not need vast armies to defeat your enemy. And so David, when he was the king of Israel, he knew all of that. But for some strange reason, known only to David, he wanted to number Israel. But the one that motivated David to do it was the devil. Because he is Satan. He is the adversary. He was coming against David. And he was driving a wedge between David and his God. And that is the greatest work of Satan. If I could get anything across in this message this morning, it is this. That the greatest work of Satan is to drive a wedge between you and God. For Satan knows that if you ever truly understand the nature of God, amen. If you ever one time get it in your soul about the one that you serve. If you ever really begin to understand who God is. You will come to Him. And you will fall at His feet. And you will joyfully worship Him as the Lord God Almighty. For He is benevolent. He's a good God. And He's the giver of life. And every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father in light. In whom is no variableness, no shadow of turning. I've never found one thing about His nature that I didn't like. I've never found one thing about His person that did not inspire me. I've never known one thing about God Almighty that did not set my soul on fire. It's God that I want. It's God that I need. It's God that gives me life. It's God that moves my soul. It's God that I aspire to. My friend, that's where Satan does his work. For he drives a wedge between us and God. So here in the book of 1 Chronicles, it was Satan that separated David from his God. He's the adversary. He's the liar. He's the thief. He cometh not for but to kill and destroy and tear down and take away what God has done. He's a good God. Amen. He's been good to me far more than I ever have been good to him. He's given me far more than I have deserved. He He's been in places I never expected to see him, but his hand was there. He's been with me at times when I didn't deserve it, but he was still there. He's a good God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will never force himself on anyone. He will never make you serve him. He will never drive you in anything. But oh, how he leads. Oh, how he leads. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. My cup runneth over. Just to know Him is to know life. It does something to the soul. If you know that you know that you know God, then you'll know the devil when he starts moving in your life. You can pinpoint Him. You can mark Him out. 
For if you haven't done anything and there's no reason for it, why is so dead today? Why is such a spirit lingering on your heart? Why is such a spirit of unbelief permeating your very being? It's because the devil, your adversary, your adversary, your adversary. You know what an adversary is? Go into a courthouse sometime into a room where the lawyers face off with each other and you'll find out what an adversary is. That prosecuting attorney, that district attorney, attorney here in Knox County, Tennessee, if he's going to prosecute you, he's going to bring his case against you. He's going to try you before a jury. He's going to present his evidence against you. And he's going to do his dead level best to get you convicted and sent down the river. Then we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen. I don't care how great that prosecuting attorney is. I don't care how much evidence he's got against him. I don't care how strong his case is. I've got an advocate with the Father. Amen. I've got an adversary, but I've got an advocate too. I'm so glad, thank God, I don't have to fight my case. I'm glad I don't have to plead my case. I'm glad I don't have to state the facts. i got one that does it for me. Amen. Hallelujah to God. I've got an advocate with the Father. He knows all the legal terminology. He knows everything about a courthouse. He knows what the law says. He knows what the law can do. But he also knows what grace can do. Amen. When that prosecuting attorney said he's guilty, he's guilty. He needs to go down the river, lock him up, throw him away. And my advocate comes in and said, I know he's guilty. Oh, I don't doubt that he's guilty. He, the evidence proves that he's guilty. But I paid his price. I paid his dues. I satisfied the judgment. The judgment cannot fall twice. The law's been satisfied. The settlement's been made. Turn him loose. Let him go. And out the door I walk a free man. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah to God. Satan stood up against Israel. Had to use David as the vehicle to do it. He'll always use another V. I'm going to tell you something right now. If you ever played chess, chess is a very interesting game. You can engross yourself in chess. I mean, you can get into a game of chess and play for weeks in one game. And you move those pieces on that board, you got to do some thinking. You better think. Because any move you make on a chess board is a, is make, it may make you vulnerable. It may make you weak. It may cost you something. It's a war, literally. From the time you start playing a chess and move that first pawn, that first move, it's war. You bring that knight out or you bring that bishop out. You begin on a war front, friend. And I want to tell you right now, that's what the Christian life is about. It's about war. It is a war. There's one out to get your adversary as a roaring lion. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The object of the game of chess is to put the other man's king in check where he can't move out of check. And if you can't move out of check, you're in checkmate. And to have that king in checkmate means that you're ultimately the winner. There might, may not be one single piece taken from the board. Every piece may still be on that board. But if you've got that king in checkmate, He's lost. The battle is not won or lost by how many men fall or how many men are taken. The battle is won or fought by who gets to the king. That's what chess is about. Amen. Amen. I've been clean many times. I thought I was moving real good. Had me a plan. Down the side I went. And this old boy moved right in on me and put me in checkmate. That's why I wasn't the first started playing the game. Because you got to watch the whole board. you got to watch everything that's going on. That's what this Christian life is about. It's not about you focusing your attention on one thing. It's about God and His ability to protect you. It's about the King. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. In the book of Job, chapter number 1 and verse 6. Satan moved against Job. In Zechariah chapter number 3 and verse 1, Satan stood at the right hand of the high priest to resist him. Notice where he does his work. He doesn't have to do his work in the gutter. He doesn't have to do his work in the bar, on the dance floor, in the raw, filthy sins of sex, or dope, or what have you. You don't need to do that. Your flesh will take care of that. Satan enters in when you start making that approach to God. When the light begins to flood in. When your heart begins to move. When your soul is stirred. At the first awakening 
from a dead, a lost spirit. That's when Satan enters in. Matthew chapter number 4 and verse 10. Satan came against Christ. Mark chapter number 1 verse 13. Matthew 16 verse 23. Satan sifted Peter. He worked on me about three years. Real hard. Thanks be unto God for the light. Thank God for the victory. Thank God for the victory. I know you talk about the victory, but wait till you've gone through the victory. Wait till you stand on the shore with Moses and look at Pharaoh's army buried beneath a dead sea, Red Sea rather. Then you'll shout the victory. Amen. That's why I'm headed. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. My, 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 my. Won't work. Dig a pit for somebody to fall into. You're going into your pit. Your life is about destroying people. Get ready. You're going down. Don't be mocked. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. I want to pray with you. I want to help you. I want to minister to you. I want to see your life better. I want to see you with God. I want to see you who are living for the Lord. But my friend, let me tell you right now, I have no desire to destroy anybody in this house today. I've seen too much of it, Brother McDonald. I've lived 61 years. I've seen too much hell. I've seen all the hell I want to see. I've seen all the broken homes I want to see. I've seen all the dead, dead dope addicts dying in early death that I want to see. I've seen all that I want to see of that. I want to see some life, some help, some mercy, and some grace. Mark chapter number 4 verse 15, Satan takes away the word when it's preached, snatches it from the heart. I've watched people listen to me when I'm preaching the Word of God. And then all of a sudden, it seems like they're in dreamland. I mean, they're off somewhere. Just mesmerized, fixed on something out there. And what it is, whatever it is, must be great. They'll be hearing you preaching, and I mean, they're with you, and all of a sudden, just boom, they're gone. You think to yourself, what's happened here? What's going on? Satan snatched the Word out of your heart. He diverted your attention. He got you on more important things. What you're going to eat at lunch tomorrow. What program you're going to watch on TV. That's far more important than your soul. Amen. <laughs> I said that facetiously, of course. But the truth of the matter is, some folks do get their mind tied up, don't they? Hey, Amen. I remember old boy talking one time. He said he went to see this old country boy. They went over to witness to him, sat on the front porch, and started opening the Bible and telling him about the Lord. And there's some coon hounds out there in the woods at night. That's coon, coon hunting's nighttime hunting, I suppose. And, and that old boy sat on the front porch. This just belonged to his neighbor, one of his friends. He could hear those coon hounds out there. Yup, 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 yup. And out in the field down there, he said, boy, they're going to get one treed here in a minute, ain't they? And they were talking to him about his soul. And just like that, he changed the subject from his soul to a coon hunt. And then, you know, that's just the way Satan did. Just snatch out of your heart the Word of God. Amen. Luke 22, verse 3, Satan enters into Judas's heart. Yeah, he does. Your adversary of the devil's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to devour you. He wants to devour you. He wants to eat you alive. He wants to take your life away. And he'll come after you like you wouldn't believe. He'll come after you. You'll say, I'm not important enough. Oh, yes, you are. He'll come after you. He'll destroy you. And the greatest weapon he can use against you is you. You realize what a conflict it is when God saves a sinner. He borns you and births you into the family of God. He puts His Holy Spirit in you. He writes your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. You still got an old dead carcass hanging on to you. You realize that God immediately puts you in a fight. Amen. At the very moment you got saved, you entered into a battle. God knows that. And if you're not in a battle, one side's won. And it's not the Holy Spirit because He'll always. The Bible says the Spirit lusteth against the flesh, lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another. They always will be. But when you start feeling good about yourself and you're no longer struggling and, and you seem to be okay now, I've just kind of got it in my mind, everything's going to be alright. I'm going to tell you where you are. You're in the flesh. 
Because you'll have to struggle to walk in the Spirit. It is a struggle. Not easy. Not cheap. But it's good. It's the good way. Joshua said, I'll show you the good way. He wants to devour. The Bible tells me if God before me, if God before us, who can be against us? If God before us, who can be against us? Say that in your heart yourself, to yourself. Just say to yourself, God's for me, God's for you. Well, God doesn't even know me, you kidding? I wish you'd have been in my Sunday school class this morning. God knows exactly who you are. Before He made the heaven and the earth, before He created anything, He knew you. Because the Word was made flesh to die for you. And the Word was from the beginning. Therefore the Word knew who you would be and who He'd die for. Say, I don't matter to people. They don't care about me. I'm just a nothing on this earth. No, you're not. No, you're not. The Bible said Christ tasted death for every man. That meant that He tasted your death, your sin, your curse. Oh, no, don't tell me you're nobody. You're here because God put you here. You say, well, the people don't accept me. They reject me. But I can't. I, nobody likes me. I can't be part of anything. Let me tell you something. The reason is because there's something about you that God Almighty is going to put His hand on and raise you to where He is. I'd rather walk with God any day of the week than be accepted by men. If you walk with the Lord, you're going to have a walk that's above men. You're going to have the greatest walk through the face of this earth. You live for God. God will bless you. Amen. I don't believe in this garbage. Don't believe it for a minute that you're an accident. And that you have no place. Some little old kid here not too long ago. Just a few weeks back. Just been a few weeks back. Somewhere out west. Seemed to me like my mind says Texas or Colorado or somewhere. This little girl was on the internet. You know this MySpace thing. It's a big deal with kids, friend. If you don't know that, it is. And she was on MySpace. And this guy came on MySpace and he started talking sweet to her. And he told her how he loved her. And he told her what, what a sweet girl she was. And how he wanted to, he wanted to meet her. He wanted to be with her. And, and all he had her all built up. God bless her little old soul. And then he comes on and he drops her. And he tells her she's no good. And he tells her she's ugly. And he tells her he, 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 he's been a fool to even waste his time with her. She goes out and hangs herself. But come to find out, do you know who did that? Do you know who told that little girl... That he loved her. He loved her. It was the neighbor's mother that did that to that kid. Oh, you don't think that's Satan? You don't know what devil is? Told that kid. I mean, kids feel rejection already bad enough. She couldn't handle it, man. I remember about ten years ago, this gang got some little girl and took her off on the bushes somewhere and killed her. Just killed her. And they said, why'd you kill that little girl? She's ugly, they said. Oh, God. Ugly? Oh, man. You see, friend, if you try to be accepted by this world, you're going to the wrong place. If you seek this world's approval or its acceptance, you're in the wrong place. you got a soul inside of you that God Almighty put there. you got a reason for being in this world. He tasted death for every man. For God so loved the world. Hallelujah to God. That's me and that's you. Amen. Amen. Ugly. Good night. What a thing. Cruel boy. That's your father, the devil, talking. Amen. If God be for us, is he for me, preacher? Yeah, he's for you. Well, he didn't give me the talent that he gave so and so. I'm not beautiful like so and so, or I'm not gifted. I'm not. I'm not brilliant like so and so. And all the, it's not so and so's fault if they are pretty, or if they are gifted, or if they are talented. But you're judging by natural judgment. And that's not what God sees. He seeth not as man seeth. No, no, no. Whether you're beautiful or not has nothing to do with God and your relationship with the Lord. It's not a curse. I mean, it's not wrong. But the fact of the matter is, that's not what it's about. No. It's about your soul. He's the lover of your soul. What makes you who you are? 
You say, well, He accept me, preacher, with open arms. He'll accept you like you've never been accepted, hug you like you've never been hugged, love you like you've never been loved, and receive you like you've never been received. If any man or woman cometh unto me, I will in no wise, no wise, no wise, no wise, no wise cast them out. Amen. Hallelujah to God. No way. No way. What about all my baggage, preacher? What about all my sins? He paid for all that. You're really offending him when you don't come to him. Because he's given you a gift and paid for your sins. All he asks you to do is accept him. What he did for you. That's what salvation is. is accepting him who did it for you. And would you do that? Say, preacher, I don't know. Does he really love me? I'll give you four things and shut up. His condescension proves he loved you. And his condescension was made the most manifest in Pilate's judgment hall. It's one thing to become the God-man. Heal the sick, raise the dead, and walk on the water. But it's quite another matter when the God-man had his back laid open. Then we understand the God-man. He laid his back open with the cat of nine tails that had big meat hooks on the end of it. They say they were trained exactly how to do it and hit the back, dig in, and then jerk the flesh away from it. Whole hunks of his hide, his body, his flesh were pulled away from the bone. His back looked like a piece of sausage. And the blood ran down it. Does he love you? Look at that back. Yeah, he loves you. His cross proves it. Huge nails like this driven into the hands and crossed his feet and into the feet. That hurt! That hurt! That hurt! I never had anything like that happen to me. I've never hurt like that. Those huge nails holding him on the tree. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. Those nails didn't hold him on the cross. No, I could have come down any time. Could I cut call twelve legions of angels? He said. What held him there, preacher? You did. His love for you, for he had to finish the work God gave him to do, or you couldn't be saved. Oh, that makes it a very precious salvation. That makes it a very precious salvation, for it's bought and paid for by the blessed Son of God. If you don't believe me, friend. Crucifixion the most horrid thing that could happen to him. It was hatched in hell. To put that on a human being. Jesus Christ said, No man taketh my life. I lay it down. Boy, you reckon he knew what he was talking about? How many think he knew what he was talking about when he said, I lay it down? You think he understood by I lay it down the fact that he knew he was going to a cross? That he was going to die a horrible death? Yeah, I do. Oh yeah, I do. I believe he fully understood the, understood the ramifications of that. All that it implied. Yeah, I believe, I believe he did. I believe he did. And for joy. The joy that was set before him. What's the joy, preacher? Creation? No, friend. He can make all the worlds in the world. He, any world he wants to make, he can make a world. Just snap his finger at all kind of world. What joy to look into your face. And say, you love me like I loved you. Look into your face and say, I see love in those eyes. You really love me, don't you? I died for you and you love me and I love you. Love is born. Love is not created. Love is born. You can't create love. You can't make love. Love is born. It's born in the heart of a born again son of God. When it fully floods into the soul, Lord God, He paid for all my sin. He paid for it on the cross. Did He love me like that? He must have loved me greatly. I love Him too. And that's what that Bible says. We love Him because He loved us. Love is born. Think about it. Of all the things in the universe, love is given birth to love one another now that did not exist before. A new thing has come into being. Love. I love Him. He loves me. That's love. And no one will ever take Him from you. And wherever He goes, you'll go. And whatever He is, you is. You will be with Him for eternity. Amen. His sending of the Holy Spirit proves it. 
He sent the Holy Ghost to me to help me, comfort me, lead me, guide me, strengthen me. I don't know about you, friend, but the only man that goes to the graveyard more than me is the fellow that works at the funeral home. That's the only one. I'm in that graveyard all the time. I'm standing at the end of a casket looking in the face of widows and the tears running down their face. I deal with life and death. That's not easy. I'm not asking for sympathy. Not at all. If, I wouldn't be, if I'm not doing what God called me to do, I need to quit, don't I? It's a ministry. It's a calling from God. But I'm going to tell you something right now. It's not a formality with me when a widow reaches over and kisses the dead corpse of her husband. Because I know they'll see each other again. There's comfort there. I've seen the Holy Spirit come into a place of the darkest dark and watch God comfort them. Bear them up. Strengthen them in the midst of places like that. Oh, it's a blessedness. Yes, it is. Finally, His coming again proves it. He said, well, He hasn't come yet. He's coming. Yes. Well, preacher, you know, i got a lot of stuff. i got a bunch of stuff planned next week. Yeah, maybe you do, maybe you don't. As the Duke of Wellington said at the Battle of Waterloo, we propose, but God disposes. Napoleon went out there at the Battle of Waterloo, and that was it for him. He wound up on the Isle of Melba. He's finished. Napoleon said this, though. He went to the tomb and stood there and looked and said, My, that was a man. Napoleon Bonaparte believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, whatever he might have been, whatever he might have believed, the leader of France, the general. He believed he was. Matter of fact, it might be surprised you'd how many of those men that went into battle did. You know, there was an old boy that locked horns with our president. Back when we had the Korean called conflict, that was a war. And Harry S. Truman told General MacArthur, he said, now let's stop right here, we're not going any further. MacArthur said, look, we can finish the Chinese off right now. We've got the momentum, we've got the sources, the troops, the manpower. We can do the job. And our president, Mr. Truman, said, no, sir, we're not going to do it. Stopped him, then fired him. And when General MacArthur came back, he addressed a joint sex session of Congress, both, both houses. In other words, the Congress and the Senate. He got up in front of those men, and he made that last statement that he's so well known for. That is that old soldiers never die. They just kind of fade away. But what's not known is that Douglas MacArthur was a fine Christian man that loved the Lord with all of his heart. Douglas MacArthur was a Christian. He didn't like to see men die in war. But he was a general and he knew that if he could destroy the power of the enemy, he could save the lives of his men. He knew that. He knew that. And that's what he did. He took Korea at Injon. Oh, he took it. They told him not to. Tide's too high, they said. So MacArthur said, let's pray. Let's pray. So they started praying. They had tides of over 30 feet at Incheon. Notorious weather. You start trying to land 30, 40, 50, 60, 100,000 troops like that, you may lose them all out there in the water. MacArthur said, we're going to do it. And when they landed at Incheon, they came in behind the North Korean army and cut them off in the southern peninsula. Cut them off. You don't suppose the Almighty had his hand in that, do you? It's kind of like the governor of Georgia. I don't even know his name. But I'm going to tell you the truth. It's been raining a lot in the last few weeks. Have you noticed? There's something about somebody in power and authority acknowledging God's sovereignty that makes a difference. Father, in Jesus' name, use what I've said, Lord. We bless you and praise you for who you are. You're a good God. You've been good to me. And Father, maybe you spoke to some soul in this house this morning, somebody that needed your touch, someone that needed a voice from God. Maybe it's a lost soul, Heavenly Father, wandering around the darkness, stumbling and falling, God. Beaten to death with their sins, with no hope, Lord, and no light. Maybe it's a lost soul. Father, I know that you said you'd leave the ninety and nine and go out and find that one. God, we pray for that soul. If they're in this house today, 
that they'd understand that you loved them and you died for them. Maybe it's a bitter soul, Father, a Christian that's been done wrong, Lord. And Satan takes it and makes it ten times worse than it ever was. Wires them out with it. Maybe it's a Christian struggling in their Christian life. Struggling, Lord. They just can't get any victory. The same old thing just keeps eating and eating and eating and beating them to death. Oh, God. They'll never get any victory till they get their eye on you as how great you are and what you got for them. What you're able to do for them. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake, we ask it. If there's any kids in this house, young people, teenagers, they feel rejected. They feel like they're not part of the crowd. Then, Lord God, give them a little wisdom and show them that any crowd that rejects them is not the crowd they want to be with to begin with. Give them a little bit of wisdom and show them, Lord, that you love them. And that you make no difference. When it comes to your salvation, you're no respecter of persons. And you'll receive them this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. For Jesus' sake we ask it. The heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Nobody looking.